So for example, using a central difference formula for a vector, function, we can write the following. We just extend our well-known central difference equation that and write df vector dx at, say, xi. It's going to be equal to f vector at xi plus 1 minus f vector at xi minus 1 divided by 2 delta x is a central difference plus order delta x squared. Or we could write this more in a more compact form as f vector i plus 1 minus f vector i minus 1 over 2 delta x plus our higher order terms. So, we simply replace the scalar u that we had in all our previous uh, derivations by the vector f. So similarly, this is, uh, we've done this in our well-known central difference formula, and similarly, to use all the schemes that we have introduced till now, we simply replace the scalar. So in all our scheme, schemes, we can do this replacement. And similarly, to this replacement, we can also replace the scalar deliver, uh, derivative. A equals DFDU by the Jacobian matrix. A equals DF vector DU vector. Okay, so for example, if we wanted to do Lax Friedrichs, what do we do? Well, Lax Friedrichs, we're going to replace the scalar u by the vector u, and we're going to replace our, um, we, I called it E for the um, inviscid equation, the flux term. We, I'm using F now for flux, uh, more. Uh, Easy to remember, but it's the same the same thing, so don't be confused by that. But so our Lax Friedrichs scheme, I can write it straight on without even thinking, and um, very easily. So our term that was replaced by the average will just have the vector u at n and both i plus one and i minus one. This is a plus i minus one. This is the vector u at n and minus delta t over 2 delta x, and we have our flux terms. So let me write it out completely. So the flux term, vector flux term at u n i plus 1 minus f at u n i minus 1, which of course can be written in a more compact form. And you can see this already is quite easy. And we have our Lax Friedrichs method there in a very compact way, which represents the full scheme for Navier Stokes equations, sorry, for the Euler equations. Um, and um, for our Lax Wendroff, again, all we do is replace u by the vector u, replace f by the flux term f. We called it, remember, we called it e before, but I'm just switching here. And so we have u n plus 1 i vector u 
u at n and i minus delta t over 2 delta x and I'm going to write this in a more short form by applying the subscript subscript and superscript just to the vector f f at i plus 1 minus f at i minus 1 and we have also another term which doesn't fit there so I'll write it down here it's delta t squared 2 delta x squared and we just now replace a by the matrix A, and we can write A N at I plus one half, and here we have F N I plus one minus F N at I, and the other term was A n at i minus one half and the flux difference here was at i and i minus one both at n where here are there was there are in fact many choices in the lax wendorf method for how to express the um, this term over here the Jacobian at the midpoint, but a choice, for example, for this is A at n i plus one half equal to A evaluated at um, u i plus one plus u i, just the average, we did this before for the scalar case and here we have it we have expressed now quite in a quite compact, compact way the whole lax wendrock scheme for the Euler equations now recall that in this case A of U is a matrix with nine entries all non-linear functions of U so evaluating A of U can actually be quite expensive. And therefore one has to be careful more in addition to being expensive evaluating um, A of U, this matrix, we also have a matrix multiplied by a vector here. So plus we have the MatVec multiplications there which are also expensive, which means that these can be a, these, this can be a major expense uh, on the lax wendorf okay, for the Euler equations. In the scalar case, we don't have that problem. So now, for example, we can write other methods. We're going to write the Richtmeier method and our McCormack method very succinctly again for the Euler equations by simply using the formulas that we've already derived and doing the substitution that we have here. So, Richtmeier method is a two-step method, you recall, and so we can write u, I'll try to be clear here with our indices, n plus one-half, so this is our predictor, step and this one uses the midpoint so this is a staggered grid so i plus one half and we evaluate this first with the previous step at n i plus one plus u at i the average minus delta t over two delta x and we have the flux at i plus 1 minus at i, both at the known time n. So this is our predictor step and our corrector 
gives us the what we want at n plus 1 and point i and it's going to be equal to u n i minus delta t over delta x and the flux at the midpoints that were obtained by the previous step so f n plus one half i plus one half minus f vector n plus one half i minus one half and here is our complete Rickmeyer method and finally the McCormack's method which is also a predictor corrector but does not use the staggered grid at the midpoints so we get our u star first our predicted value from the previous time step n u n at i delta t over delta x and the flux difference between points i plus 1 and point i both at n our correct step giving us what we want at n plus 1 and i equals to we use the average here u and i plus u star i minus delta t over 2 delta x our flux difference between i and i minus 1 and this is the star values and here's our McCormack method very succinctly written and it doesn't look much different at all from our scalar case all thanks to this vector notation so uh, let me discuss introduce a couple of test problems which are classic test problems used in this context very standard test problems uh, they're called sods test problem because mr sod published in 1978 um, a paper famous paper that describes this standard test and there are two so test number one is the following we will have the unknowns in these two tests are going to be the same and they are the fluid pressure velocity speed of sound and density entropy and Mach number so we in a little while ago in the class I showed you the vector notation for the um, Euler equations in um, conservative form but you can also use them in, in primitive form that is you can also apply this vector notation when you write the equations um, uh, with uh, density velocity and pressure rather than these uh, combined u squared plus p and, and so on so um, vector notation we're going to use just to make this easier in the Euler equation but it's called in primitive variables rho, mu, and p and this is a ribbon problem so our initial condition is going to be sorry at x zero time zero going to be equal to a left solution and a right solution x so it's centered at zero and our left is equal to rho left, u left, and p left, and the initial conditions are 1 kilogram 
per cubic meter, zero velocity, zero meters per second, and 100 kilonewton per square meter. So pressure. And the right solution, the right initial condition, is equal to rho right, u right, and p right. And these are We have a much less dense gas on the right, 0 0.125 kilograms per cubic meter. The velocity is still, st still zero, like in the shock tube. Everything is quiet before you break the diaphragm. And the pressure on the right is 10 kilonewton per square meter. So you have a pressure ratio between 110 of 10 times between the two sides. So, for example, a discretization using n equals 50 points in a domain that goes between minus 10 meters and 10 meters. This gives you a delta x of 20 meters divided by 50 equals to 0.4. We start with an initial CFL, because we're going to keep our um, time step constant, so the CFL changes as the velocity of this thing changes, is going to be equal to 0.4. And uh, you can calculate the, um, from this has an analytical solution, and so from the analytical solution we know that the initial wave speed is equal to 374.17 meters per second. And so with that speed and that CFL, we can calculate the time step. And that is delta T equal to 0 0.4, the CFL number here. And our delta X is 0.4 meters. And the speed is 374. 17 meters per second and that gives us a very small one 4.276 times 10 to the minus 4 seconds and so we have a ratio delta T over delta X equal to 1.069 times 10 to the minus 3 seconds divided by meters. So here we have all our discretization parameters for test number one. Here, test number one is completely described, and one can now apply all of the schemes that we've written down, Lax, Friedrichs, Lax, Wendroff, McCormack, and Richtmeier, and look at the results. Let me write down the second test, and then I will show you some results. So the second test, test number two, again the unknowns are the same, and the only difference is we have different initial condition, the left, rho left, u left, and p left are one kilogram per cubic meter, zero, the velocity at time zero is always zero, we have 100 kilonewton divided by square meter, and our solution, our initial condition right is density right, velocity right, pressure right equal to 0 0.01 kilograms per cubic meter. Again, the velocity is 0 and 1 kilogram per cubic meter. Uh, sorry, square meter. Now, notice that the pressure ratio here is much larger. It turns out this test, you know, for several reasons, uh, but... Uh, 
y los ninjas. Um, but the pressure ratio is much larger than the other one, and so this test is actually harder, okay? Numerical parameters, again, for our schemes, n equals 50, but we'll have a different um, domain. The domain is going to go between minus 10 meters and 15. Oh, I forgot something about the previous one. With that, I didn't write it down, actually. But with that combination of uh, parameters that we had in test number one, uh, you have a particular delta T, and uh, actually you want to get the solution. Like in here, you want the solution at, for both tests, you want the solution at T equal to um, 0 0.01. Seconds. This is this is this. This is a standard test, so everything is given. And in test number one, with those parameters that were given, you reach that time in about 23 time steps. Okay. Okay. For this guy, we have delta x is equal to 25 meters divided by 50. That gives you about 0.5. Uh, the initial CFL. is 0.3, the maximum wave speed initially is the same as before, 374.17 meters per second. Time step, delta T is equal to 0.3, the CFL times 0.5 divided by the wave speed. gives you 4.01 times 10 to the minus 4 seconds. And we have delta T divided by delta X equal to, with the parameters given above, 8.02 times 10 to the minus 4 seconds divided by meters. So in this case, to reach the final time T equals 0 0.01 seconds, you need 25 time steps about 25 time steps. Okay, that completely defines our test problems. The two test problems are completely defined. And you can imagine how now you could have uh, the different schemes for the order equations and get all of those parameters. So, to end this class, I just want to show you results that are obtained with the different schemes. So the first one, Lax Friedrichs for test number one. And here is the pressure. So the pressure has this jump, of course, going to the right. This is our shock wave. And uh, the expansion occurs over here. And you can see, well, more or less what you expect quite a bit of numerical dissipation. The solution is smoothed out quite a bit. That is the pressure. The, of course, the, um, the lines here are the analytical solution, while the circles, the open circles, represent the numerical solution. And so you see that in addition to a considerable amount of numerical dissipation, we see the same thing, same thing that we saw before for the scalar case, this odd even decoupling, the staircase shape. Exactly the same thing. This is the full Navier Stokes equations with density, velocity, pressure, and energy, everything. You can um, now you see that our experiment that we did with the, just the simple nonlinear, um, the inviscid Virgo's equation, exhibits all of the important features that you uh, will get with Euler equations. And we look at the velocity, the velocity again, considerable numerical dissipation, the staircase pattern of the odd even decoupling. If you look at the speed of sound, uh, again, considerable dissipation. This is the density and the entropy and the Mach number. Now, consider test number two. Test number two, 
um, doesn't do too bad considering it's a, a difficult test, but we see again considerable numerical diffusion and the odd even decoupling of Lax Friedrichs that was observed previously with the Mrs. Burgers. This is the velocity and speed of sound is very smoothed out, very uh, smeared out density. This is test number two, right? Entropy, Mach number. Now we're looking at McCormick's. With McCormick's, we, same thing that we saw with the visit Burgers equation. We have a pretty nice, um, you know, uh, gradient here, but we see this overshooting uh, over here for the pressure, which is not good at all. And um, these rather severe oscillations here, if we look at the velocity, again, we have some overshooting. If we look at the speed of sound, quite considerable overshooting here, but some nice gradient represented. Um, again here, severe oscillations in the density. That's not very good. And this is looks very bad, actually. Entropy, Mach number. So even though the previous method, like Friedrich's is first order, it would seem from looking at these results that actually the first order method turns out to be better because the severe overshoots here and the oscillations um, just look too bad, right? They seem, this is McCormack's with test number one. Now Richtmeier. Richtmeier again has these overshoots. It's better, it looks much better actually than McCormack here. You can see, and look how nice it actually captured the to capture this this fan, it ca uh, this is a little bit actually off, and you have the overshoot here. Pressure, that point down here is not good for our pressure, not good at all. Velocity, look at this overshoot here, not very good. It's very, but it very well represented in this uh, sloping area, but the overshoot is not very good at all. Speed of sound. Again, it looks a bit of a mess here. And uh, the density over here, entropy, and Mach number. Okay, now we're going to look at McCormack's, but with artificial viscosity added. You had the experience of adding artificial viscosity in your practical module that you did recently with the nonlinear visit Berger's equation, and these are results that would be obtained if you did the whole order of equations in a similar way with McCormick's scheme adding artificial viscosity. Now you see this is much, much better. Now test number two, which in fact is harder than test number one because it's, it's, it's got um, in fact um, just a few, for example, between the shock wave here and um, there's an expansion and a shockwave, and somewhere in between there's a contact discontinuity. There's only like one, two, three, four, five points. There's really not many mesh points there, so that's quite hard for the numerical scheme to pin down. But here it was actually done quite well with even this very coarse mesh. And velocity, we have a little bit of an overshoot here, okay? But it looks much better than without numerical diffusion in any case. Speed of sound, density, entropy, we're still seeing some bit of oscillations but not nearly as much as without the artificial viscosity and the Mach number. Now finally the final uh, exhibit I wanted to show you is Richtmeier for test number two, which I told you is the hardest test, but with the artificial viscosity. And now you're seeing a very nice result. The artificial viscosity, of course, has the effect of smoothing out a little bit these ends over here, but it's capturing the analytical solution very well. It actually behaves much better than the McCormack scheme, uh, but, of course, with the help of the numerical viscosity. Look at how well this um, gradient here is represented. 
just a very small amount of overshoot over here. This doesn't look too well, but this is quite hard to uh, resolve with so little, so few mesh points there. Speed of sound was that. Density looks quite nice. We, know, we no longer have these oscillations in density. Oscillations in density are bad always. You don't want that because, you know, you can have things like mass not being conserved and things like that. Not very good or much more terrible would be if you get negative densities. And if you have overshoots and oscillations, then you could potentially get negative density in your solution. That would be really bad. But that doesn't seem to happen here. It, looks, it behaves very nicely. Entropy and finally Mach number. So that's all that I wanted to show you. You can see that now the same type of observations that we made with a very simple model equation, the Invisiburgers equation, all of the things that we observed for the different schemes that were presented, all of them apply very well to the full Euler equations. You didn't have to actually go and program the whole Euler equations to see how they would behave. And this is the power, in fact, of using the model equations, which simplify our treatment very much, but we can gain all, almost all the insight needed to understand how the numerical scheme is going to behave in the full um, system that we require for, for the fluid mechanics. Okay, so this is where I wanted to finish today.